infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Uh, joining me on the phone now is Dr. Peter Hotez. He's the president of the Sabin Vaccine Institute and the founding dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine. Good afternoon, sir, and thanks for coming on today. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on again, as a matter of fact. Um, let me steal uh, the first line of your article published in the Huffington Post uh, late February. And it says, one of the least known consequences of modern conflict in the Middle East and East Africa has been the widespread devastation that results from the tropical infection known as leishmaniasis. As most people who watch the news, we see the carnage of war and other conflicts in the Middle East. However, this is an unseen uh, threat and it's ignored by most media. So in the simplest, simplest possible terms, Dr. Hotez, what is leishmaniasis and What's going on in Syria and those other countries of conflict concerning leishmaniasis? Well, well, thanks for asking. So I like sometimes call leishmaniasis, as I do several of these neglected tropical diseases, the most important disease you've never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, when you think of the consequences of war and conflict, not many people uh, give adequate thought to some of the outbreak of diseases that can happen, but, you know, people will are aware of the problem of uh, cholera, for instance, which uh, will often happen after a calamity such as the earthquake in Haiti. But almost no one, no one has really heard of leishmaniasis, but yet it now ranks as one of the most important, if not the most important, diseases arising in the setting of war and conflict in all modern wars. And, uh, and I'll give you two examples. Uh, one of them is is uh, what happened after uh, during the war between uh, North and South Sudan, the Civil War, where you had during the 1980s, where you had people fleeing the conflict and heading towards refugee refugee camps along the border with Ethiopia. During this period, there was uh, malnutrition and uh, the, a lot of exposure to the bites of sandflies. So leishmaniasis is a parasitic infection that's transmitted by sandflies. And the result is there was a massive outbreak uh, of, among people uh, fleeing conflict uh, associated with human migrations in Sudan and bordering on Ethiopia. And the estimates are that more than 100,000 people died. So this, from from a form of leishmaniasis known as visceral leishmaniasis, right. also mm -hmm. by the, goes by the name of Cal, is are. So this now, in my opinion, represents the most, most lethal conflict in all, most lethal epidemic in all associated all modern warfare, and maybe the most lethal epidemic we've had in modern times, and yet it, it's gone almost unreported. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there and see if you have a question. And yeah, I, I just want to ask you about, you, you mentioned refugees. Um, why would the influx of refugees... Um, create a better climate for sandfly bites? That's a good question. So it's it's more of a consequence that when people are fleeing conflict zones and therefore sleeping outdoors, uh, sleeping under conditions of exposure, okay. they have the, they're, they're susceptible to the bites of sandflies. And this is not unique to refugees. So for instance, when our troops uh, went into Iraq and later in Afghanistan, and they were, uh, so for instance, where a lot of our U.S. troops were bivouacked in uh, Kuwait and uh, and in, in Iraq uh, during the uh, invasion uh, to get Saddam Hussein out, uh, they were also massively exposed to sandfly, sandfly bites, and they were exposed to this infection, although it was a different form of the infection, only associated with skin lesions. But I'll come back to that in a minute. But in terms of the visceralizing form, Calazar, that killed so many people in Sudan, this is a disease that produces a leukemia-like illness where it 
destroys the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow and uh, makes people unable to uh, fight infection. So if somebody were to come uh, with the Calazar visceral leishmaniasis to the U.S., they usually get misdiagnosed as having a leukemia because many physicians are not uh, aware of this disease, but it was it had devastating consequences. We've seen it again now uh, in Syria. So Syria has always battled leishmaniasis, but a different form of the disease associated with disfiguring ulcers on the skin. And the locals call it Aleppo evil, referring to the, the, the one of the major cities right. uh, in Syria. Now, with the, the civil conflict there, again, you have a breakdown in public health infrastructure, people fleeing conflict, people are exposed to sand fly bites. They also... Uh, there's also a lot of uh, absence of garbage collection, refuge refuse collection, and so this also helps the sand flies proliferate. So you get the perfect storm of sand flies as a consequence. Now the estimates are more than a hundred thousand cases of Aleppo evil have struck the people of Syria, many of them kids. The reason it's a problem is it produces a disfiguring ulcer on the face that unless you get treated by injections into the skin of an antimony containing compound to treat it, you can be scarred for life. And this particularly hits girls and young women who are, as a consequence, rendered unmarriageable or it's grounds for you know, spousal abandonment. Uh, so there's, it's a very stigmatizing uh, lesion as well. And, and, and in some cases, the sand flies may be following refugees into camps along the border with Turkey, along the border with uh, Lebanon as, as well. And the, problem, and the frustration, of course, is that the World Health Organization just cannot safely operate in Syria right now. So they're kind of at the margins of uh, a lot of this devastation. Yeah. And you mentioned there are several types of leishmaniasis. And uh, another thing in your article that you clearly articulate is the need for a vaccine for this parasite. Um, and it's interesting in a time of the political back and forth uh you make a very unusual suggestion you call for in your words vaccine diplomacy uh and you're talking about a joint u.s iran cooperation to develop and test new vaccines can you uh talk a little bit about that Sure, happy to. So uh, we, you know, we. I've been advocating now for stockpiling of leishmaniasis vaccines for crisis situations such, such as these. And uh, in fact, I was on a panel discussion uh, this week. Uh, the Gates Foundation, together with the World Health Organization and uh, the NIH held a meeting at, at, uh, near the NIH campus in Bethesda uh, where I uh, talked about the need for stockpiling a vaccine in, in conflict situations. Now, in terms of developing and manufacturing a, a leishmaniasis vaccine, the problem is who's going to pay for it. So the, you know, this is, this is a neglected tropical disease. By definition, these are diseases that only affect peop the, peop the poorest of the poor, people living in extreme poverty. And the major pharmaceutical companies are not positions to make such vaccines. So we're, we're developing them in the nonprofit sector. So our, we, our organization, uh, the Sabin Vaccine Institute Product Development Partnership, which is based at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, is developing a first generation recombinant leishmaniasis vaccine. Now, ultimately, though, we're going to need a partner who's going to scale it up. And the question is, who does that? Well, we've increasingly, in our product development partnership, have been looking to about a dozen IDCs, innovative developing countries. These are countries with great pockets of poverty, but have learned to punch above their weight in terms of making products. So examples are the Brazilians, for instance, make most of their own vaccines. Uh, the Mexicans now make vaccines. But in, in the Middle East, uh, there's limited abilities, but one of the countries that can make vaccines are the Iranians have had some some interest and success at uh, trying to develop some prototype leishmaniasis vaccines, including places like the Institute de Pasteur in, in Tehran uh, and others. So I've been advocating for why aren't we partnering to work on this together, share knowledge, best practices, and work together to make a vaccine. Now, it's not as crazy as you might think. The, no, I, I don't think the, that. <laughs> the, um, the uh, you know, many people don't realize that the oral polio vaccine that we all took as children uh, 
uh, was developed as a Cold War collaboration between the United States and the Soviet Union. Right. So Albert Sabin uh, developed, Dr. Albert Sabin developed that oral polio vaccine jointly with the Soviets right after the Sputnik launch. At one, you know, one of the worst times in the Cold War, the vaccine was jointly tested on 10, 10 million Soviet school children. Ultimately, uh, all, every Soviet citizen under the age of 20 did this in collaboration with Dr. Chumakov and Shtanov and, and Smardensov and others. And that were the studies that led to licensure of the oral polio vaccine. So as an example, how two countries could put aside their ideologies for purposes of making a life-saving product. Uh, this is not taking any business away from the pharmaceutical companies. They're not going to go into leishmaniasis vaccines anyway. Right. Uh, it seems to me that this is a reasonable uh, place to begin. I mean, now there's a lot of political uh, uh, and so there's a lot of political hurdles to to trying to prevent that. But we're now engaged in some interesting dialogues with partners to see if we we can make this happen. The thing that's very important, I think, is not to try to do this by going through the back door. This has to be done in a very open and transparent manner with the full cooperation of both the U.S. and the Iranian governments, and uh, that's not an easy one, but something we're working toward. No, I think that's a fantastic idea, and vaccine diplomacy uh, uh, certainly would uh, break down some of the barriers, I believe. Right. Yeah.